Ella and I'm the Plants Meow and welcome to my channel. So today I'm going to be doing an Anthurium care video and I've been wanting to put this out for so long. So to the side over here, I'm going to put times where you can kind of just go to the sections if you want to just go through one at a time or if you only need help with one section, I'm not going to be offended. This is a long video. So while it is an extensive video, it is not all comprehensive. There are going to be things that are going to be missing. Some of the things I haven't included on this list that I do want to cover, it's just something that this video is not going to allow time for, or I felt was too detailed for it. So I will make other videos in the future regarding Ethereum care. I just wanted to kind of do this basic one here. So the reason that I wanted to do this massive video instead of individual videos on light and watering and things like that is because when I got into Anthuriums, the place that I went to, the place that we usually all go to is YouTube. So it is our how to do place. And honestly, YouTube is not a great source for Anthurium care. I'm going to tell you that right up front. I mean, there has been more people recently like Legends of Monstera who has put some Anthurium care tips out there. So please go check out his channel. He's amazing. <laughs> but for the most part, not a true care video. So I ended up doing my own research. I did online research. I bought books. I talked to people. There's just a lot of different resources that I went to for this video. And I just went off my own experience. So I've had a lot of trial and error. This is all the stuff that works best for me. So I hope it helps you. And I'm not just going to be telling you how to take care of your Ethereum, but I'm going to be telling you why you have to do certain things. So a lot of the times the video will tell you to do something, but you don't always do it. And I'm really just going to tell you the side effects of possibly not doing these things. So I hope this is really informative to you. If you have any additional information down below you would like to share with everyone, please do. And I hope you enjoy this video. So to begin with, Anthuriums are a type of aeroid. So what differentiates an aeroid from all other plants is the fact that they have a spathe and a spatic. So what specifically makes Anthuriums unique in this group is the fact that they have a geniculum and a collective vein. <laughs> so the geniculum is the part that connects the petiole and the leaf. So it's the part that allows the leaf to move back and forth in each direction or up and down so that they can be facing the sun. So the niculum itself is essentially the joint of the anthurium and the collective vein itself is a specialized and submarginal vein that is actually on the edge of the leaf. So anthuriums. So we know what makes them essentially unique. Where do they come from? This is the important part because when you got to think about their care, you got to know where they originate from. Now these are neotropic plants. So you're really going to find them in the tropical parts of South America, Southern Mexico, parts of the Caribbean and Central America. And there are also going to be some on the Andes mountains. And this is going to be within the rainforests of Ecuador and Colombia. Now these are specifically neotropic plants. So what that means, the places that are selling them in Asia, the South Pacific, Hawaii, and Indonesia, those are all imported there. They're in an introduced species. They are not natural to those areas. They are only natural to the Southern tropics. And a lot of these anthuriums, you will find that they are epiphytic. So that means they're just gonna be growing up trees. So naturally not sitting in kind of any heavy soils, they're gonna be receiving lots of air to their root. And those that are hemiepiphytic, Sorry if I'm saying any of this wrong. They start in the soil, but they do eventually go up trees as they mature. And then you have those that are epipetric that grow on stones. <laughs> so now what we're gonna talk about here is temperature. The ideal temperature for our anthuriums is between 65 and 80 degrees. I'm gonna tell you right now, do not let your anthuriums drop below 55 degrees. Some do like it cool, yes, but not cold. I'm gonna stress that. So cold temperatures will actually freeze the cells in your plants and cause them to starve. And even brief exposure can have serious consequences for your anthurium. So just be careful. And when it comes to higher temperatures, which people may not really think about, try not to go above 90 degrees. Brief exposure of this is okay, but high temperatures can cause the stomata on the plant to close, which can stunt photosynthesis. An alternative to the stomata closing is that they just remain open. So they're going to do this in order to cool their leaves through transpiration. And this is known as evaporative cooling. And while this does sound great, and it is temporarily, you don't want to have this happening for long amounts of time because your anthurium really relies on that water. So like all plants, anthuriums are autotrophs. So what that means is essentially they're green plants and they're self-nourishing. So they actually create their own food through photosynthesis and their foods include things like carbohydrates and glucose. So glucose 
glucose will actually give your plant energy. And glucose does help to create cellulose, which does help to build and grow cell walls. I know you could be thinking, why are you explaining this? But it kind of goes to the format of my video and it's kind of, gonna make sense you're gonna be like semi experts not like total experts but i'm gonna try here <laughs> and we all know what photosynthesis needs at least i hope we do and that's gonna be the sun water and carbon dioxide so why is light important it's because when that sun comes out the stomata in your plants open up and when they open up that allows photosynthesis to begin so the green parts of your plants are what we call chlorophyll so they're actually going to be absorbing the photons from the sun what anthurium's like is bright but indirect sun and i mean indirect do not leave these indirect light if you do think of you like how would you feel about standing in front of the sun a lot of this video is going to be if you're comfortable with it your anthurium is probably going to be comfortable with it direct light will actually cause their leaves and their flowers to burn now let's say they are in bright indirect light but they're just receiving too much sun yes that's actually a thing so what happens when you do that is that your leaves and flowers will have a bleached color to them they won't be a typical kind of deep hue that we all love especially on our velvety anthurium and you could also have the side effects of your leaf tips burning it's actually interesting a lot of things will cause your leaf tips to burn and that's not just humidity like people think so a lot of the times people will go out of their way to kind of just fix humidity but they're not thinking about all the other things could it be my watering my light they don't really think about that just humidity and humidity Humidity is not everything. So actually our velvety anthuriums prefer lower light, but do not keep them in a dark corner. <laughs> That's right, don't put baby in a corner. So you will know if your anthurium is not receiving enough light because the leaf will just be so much darker because your plant is overcompensating by creating a lot more chlorophyll in order to absorb the light that it does have access to. Now, dark leaves. Sometimes there are cases where we actually want darker leaves than our anthuriums. Is that a crime? So not necessarily. As long as they're receiving enough of foot candles, which there are apps on your phone that you can download to measure the foot candles that your plant is actually receiving. But typically anthuriums will be okay between 50 and 500 foot candles. So they can actually handle lower light levels, which is pretty awesome. And it's great for us people that really love those beautiful dark hued colored leaves. Surprisingly enough, they can tolerate as low as 10 foot candles, but this is definitely not recommended because your anthurium is not gonna flourish with 10 foot candles. You're not gonna have it flower. It's really not gonna be growing or photosynthesizing like it should be. So I do not recommend 10. So watering. So in the forest, this can actually happen daily. And these anthuriums are perfectly happy with that. And why is that? So it's because in these situations, they are not sitting in heavy soils and the water just drains freely off of them. So it's not about the amount of water you're giving your anthuriums. It's really about how heavy your soil is. So while yes, it is recommended to water your anthuriums until you see them start to drain, it is critical that you have them in a well-draining mix. I personally water mine about every three days and I haven't had any issues with that. As epiphytic plants, they're always damp in the forest due to humidity and rain. You can actually water them even every day if you really wanted to. It's really about the soil composition that you have. Do not allow your anthurium to get bone dry. This is actually really critical and it is possible to kill them this way. Even if your anthurium lives, it has suffered moisture stress. You'll pretty much know you've waited too long when it is drooping. Honestly, you should have them on a schedule and just make sure they don't get to that critical point. So underwatering your anthurium and letting them dry out will actually stunt their growth and cause their tips to burn. It actually also stunts photosynthesis. So what that means is the stomata in the plant close up and your plant will stop transpiring because there's not enough water in the plant to create pressure in the guard cells that allows the stomata to open. This is actually a technique to conserve water. <laughs> so you may be thinking, why is this a bad thing? besides stunting photosynthesis part. It really has to do with transpiration. Our plants transpire and they do this because of evaporative cooling if it's too hot. They rely on the carbon dioxide entry for photosynthesis and they actually use it for nutrient uptake from the soil. But you're also not letting your soil dry out when you underwater your anthurium. You are letting your leaves dry out. So while your plant is trying to transpire in this process, you have to think of it this way. The carbon dioxide molecules are much larger than water molecules. So essentially you're gonna have larger molecules trying to get 
into your plant while your plant is slowly suffering and transpiring all this water out. So it's just losing more water than it's really, it's just not benefiting. It's a terrible situation. Don't underwater your anthurium. But also don't allow your anthurium to sit in water. So once you're done watering your anthurium, because you never forget to water it, always empty your drip trays. So remember they grow up trees, they're never left in standing water. It just trickles down off of them. <laughs> and also if you're letting them sit in water, it's really gonna create a situation where the roots are not getting any air. And no air really just means you're gonna have fungal growth and root rot occur in your anthurium. And nobody wants that. So an obvious note here, make sure you have a drainage hole. <laughs> Think about it this way. Would you be okay with standing in a puddle of water? It's not comfortable. And if you're not comfortable with it, your anthurium's not comfortable with it. Remember that. <laughs> if you remember things like that, if you're comfortable, then they'll be comfortable. It's really helpful. So a lot of the times, if you really like a cash pot, just use an inner pot and put them in that cash pot. You don't have to plant them directly in the cash pot. Use your pretty pot. Just put them in something else. <laughs> so one of the tips I have here is to water your plants in the morning. Now I'm not saying <laughs> to not water your plants at night if your anthurium needs it. I have watered mine at night. They've been completely fine. I just recommend the morning time if you are able to. Two reasons for that is one, in highlight situations that plants actually require more water to photosynthesize as the sun will cook a lot of that water off. And in low light situations, you're actually giving the plant the entire day to dry off so that they are not sitting in wet potting mix for too long. Use room temperature water. Hot water will cook your roots and cold water will shock them. So in watering, main thing you gotta remember, don't forget to water it and don't allow it to sit in water. So next we're gonna talk about air and why is air important for your anthurium? Why is it important to you? So if the air around your ethereum is actually stagnant and very low, and your CO2 levels are very low, the stomata in your plant will stay open in order to fuel photosynthesis, but it will dry out your leaves. See the common theme here? A lot of these things result in drying out leaves. <laughs> so our anthuriums have this thing called a boundary layer. It's this layer that is around all of our leaves that is thick with water vapor and it actually slows transpiration. So what air does is it will decrease this boundary layer. So when your air is calm, your boundary layer is super thick, which means your water loss is greatly diminished, which is nice for not drying, but so is your water uptake. And this is something that can result in nutritional deficiencies. Since they have this boundary layer, when you actually group a bunch of your plants together, they're gonna increase in humidity because of all of that water vapor around them. But if you do this, you need to provide proper air circulation. And that's because oxygen is vital to keep your anthuriums disease free. Giving them air will actually prevent any kind of mold or fungus growth. So in my plant room, I actually have a fan in there. I have it parallel to my plants so they're not directly on top of them and it's giving enough air circulation to the room. And you don't want your fans directly on top of your anthuriums blowing in their faces because this is gonna result in the stomata to close and it's gonna stunt photosynthesis. <laughs> so, and also another thing you don't wanna do, like put the fan in front of them, is also not to put them in drafty areas. So don't put them right next to an air vent or a door that opens and closes quite frequently. It's just gonna dry them out way too much. So while air is great, there's some things in the air that is not great for your anthurium. So just make sure to keep these kind of out of their way. <laughs> so I don't know why this would be a thing, but car exhausts are not great for your anthuriums as are household cleaning products or ethylene gas, which actually is caused by the ripening of fruit or decaying plant material. So that's also another reason it's important to kind of keep the area around your anthurium clean. You're Really don't want any kind of dead leaves lurking around or debris because that can possibly result in a fungal issue. So now the part everyone stresses about, which is humidity. <laughs> so humidity is actually the amount of moisture in the air around us. So typically anthuriums do need high humidity. Out in the tropics, they're used to about between 77 and 88% humidity, but they can handle lower levels if they are watered regularly. What? <laughs> 
So when the humidity in your room is low, your Ethereum will actually lose a lot of water through transpiration because it's trying to make up for the moisture that is lacking in the air. So it's really important to keep your soil hydrated so it has a source of water that it can pull from. Low humidity and dry soil will cause the browning of your leaves. So here are a few ways to actually help increase the humidity around your plants. Honestly, grouping your plants together will help create a boundary layer. I don't suggest putting your plants right, like, right on top of each other because you want a little bit of air so that even when you do have a air circulation going around, you do have air going between everything because you don't want that boundary layer super thick. So our second one is our trusty humidifiers. I know a lot of us plant people have them. A lot of us probably don't. I honestly would recommend one. I do use one for my anthuriums. I know the humidity I keep in my house, which some of you may gasp at because there are people out there that keep their humidity at 80% for their anthuriums. My anthuriums are kept inside my house and I get worried about kind of mold growth in my home. So I actually keep mine between 55 and 60% humidity, which sounds low, but honestly, I'm not having any issues. So I think I'm okay. I really do keep on top of their care. I check on them. And if I do think they need a little TLC, they can go next to my humidifier. Actually something else that I recently purchased for other reasons, which I'll talk about in a later video, is an indoor greenhouse. So naturally, even without a humidifier, it's gonna be probably about 10% higher in there with humidity. So right now I do have a humidifier in mine and it stays about 70 to 80 percent in there so if you do have plants that really do need it and you are worried about them indoor greenhouses are the way to go they're pretty awesome just remember to put that fan in there because you need that air circulation so another thing you can do is get a gravel tray so this will actually help to create a microclimate around your plants but do not allow the roots to touch the gravel because if they're just sitting in water you will get root rot so then we have misting and yes this is controversial and this is kind of just my take on it. So when you mist your plants, your plants will absorb some of that water into them and the rest will just evaporate into the air. So think of their natural environment. So in the tropical areas, they typically get brief kind of bursts of rain where this happens. They are moist quite often. There's lots of water. People are always concerned about the fungal growth when they remain damp. But honestly, if you have air circulation, that's not gonna be an issue. <laughs> you can mist your endurums all you want if you have good air circulation. And if you're concerned the water actually evaporates too quickly off your leaves, don't be. That's actually a good thing. If it didn't evaporate at all, that means there's no benefit to the plant. It evaporating means it's actually creating higher humidity in the air around your plant. And if the water from your misting isn't allowed to dry out, this is what can cause fungus and bacterial growth to occur. Also on a caution, don't mist if your humidity is high. If you don't have proper air circulation and your humidity is high, then you're gonna have a disaster going on. And honestly, it doesn't need to be misted if you already have high humidity. And I recommend misting them only during the daytime. And this is simply because the stomata is closed at night. So if you spray them, it's gonna put pressure in those guard cells and open up the stomata. And really, I don't see any benefit to that. So if you can, just do it in the daytime. And honestly, with misting, if anything, spider mites hate it. So the next way to actually have higher humidity is to either put your plant in a bathroom or a basement. Typically these areas do have higher humidity. So honestly with humidity, the main takeaway you should have here is that as long as you practice good watering habits and air circulation, you'll be surprised how humidity tolerant your Ethereum can be. Ah, fertilizer, a thing no one wants to hear about. So earlier I talked about plants being autotrophs, which are self-nourishing. So if plants are autotrophs, why in the heck do they need fertilizer? Well, I'm gonna ask you a question here. Can you write in a language without being taught the alphabet first? <laughs> Your plant actually needs a number of chemical elements, such as the water, carbon, and photons, but also needs other nutrients in order to be able to perform these functions. So macronutrients are actually considered the building blocks of your plant. And honestly, they just can't grow without them. 
So the main ones you hear about are your NPK, which is your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen is important because your cells need protein and protein needs nitrogen. Phosphorus is important because every cell membrane contains this and potassium is essential to your plant's metabolism. Additionally, I'm going to be talking about magnesium because magnesium is something actually that your chlorophyll requires and it's considered a secondary nutrient. But what could happen to your plants if you don't give them these nutrients? Is it really that bad? Well, it can result in no flowering of your plants. You could have yellowing of older leaves, deformed younger leaves, the stunting of your plant's growth, chlorotic and necrotic plant leaves, and possibly the death of your plant. So I'll actually be making a video about specifically which nutrient deficiencies have side effect wise on your anthuriums. So a lot of people think anthuriums are epiphytic. They don't need nutrients, right? And that's a myth. <laughs> so where did anthuriums obtain their nutrients? So they obtain it from the decaying leaf litter that kind of just builds up around their roots. There's even minerals in the rainwater. And nature's crazy because one of the things that happens with this rainwater is that these minerals are blown away from far away places and they just kind of get thrown into the rain and then they get absorbed by our anthuriums and they get their nutrients through that. It's just kind of one of the crazy miracles of nature. <laughs> so we've talked about that, yes, your anthurium needs fertilizer. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about what could you do to fertilize your anthurium. So there are people that like to use liquid fertilizers, specifically with anthuriums, I don't think they're the best policy. If you do, I would recommend watering them weekly, weekly. Use about a fourth of the manufacturer's recommended amount. And the reason why this kind of fertilizer is great is because it is released immediately into your plant. So if you think your anthurium is suffering from nutrient deficiency, I would definitely recommend going with the liquid fertilizer route and then transition to maybe a slowly dissolving fertilizer. So the kind of fertilizer that I like to use is my Osmocote 14, 14, 14. So this is actually the flower and vegetable kind. And the specific one is good for your anthuriums because our anthuriums do flower. So how these work is I usually just sprinkle some on top and really just apply it every six months. So this is great because you can just kind of pour it in after you pot your anthurium and it just slowly dissolves over six months and you don't gotta sweat it. <laughs> so how slow release fertilizers work is that the coating around each pebble will slowly dissolve, which allows the nutrients to escape and reach the roots. It is a slower method than liquid. So like I said, if you want immediate, go with that liquid. But the easiest route will definitely be these slow release fertilizers. Also keep in mind that smaller anthuriums are gonna need less fertilizer than larger ones. And anthuriums grown in kind of warmer and sunnier climates are gonna need more than those that are grown in cooler ones. So I want to urge you to be careful not to over fertilize and err on the side of caution. So one of the ways you'll know if you over fertilize your anthurium is that your lower leaves will turn yellow and your tips will burn, common pattern. <laughs> so make sure before you roll out the fact that it is fertilizer that you do check your anthurium for infections because that could possibly be the culprit and not your fertilizer. Most of the time when you use these slow release fertilizers, they do have no burn pledge on them as it is very slow release. You can feel pretty confident that this is not going to be burning your anthurium. But if you have over fertilized it, Make sure to just flush out your pot and then reduce the amount of fertilizer you do use going forward. So earlier I did mention that chlorophyll does need magnesium. So what I usually do is I just apply Epsom salt. <laughs> so this is magnesium sulfate. And this is something to apply about monthly to your anthuriums. So you can do about one to two tablespoons per gallon of water and just water your anthuriums like normal. So another method to do this is for every foot of your plant, get a teaspoon of this and just sprinkle it on the soil and then water it in. And lastly, the foliage option is to use about a teaspoon per gallon of water and spray this directly on your foliage. And this will actually result in quicker absorption for your anthurium. And another benefit to the magnesium sulfate that isn't just to give nutrients to your plant is that if you do over fertilize your plant, you can can use it to leach out excessive nutrients from your soil. So you mix about a teaspoon per gallon and just kind of rinse your soil out with that very generously. All right, so now for planters. So first I'm gonna be talking about closed container planters. Closed container planters aren't the greatest for your anthurium. So the first one we have here is terracotta or clay pots. So <laughs> I hope you don't love this. <laughs> it'll pretty much result in this. So you will end up breaking your terracotta pot in order to get your anthurium out. So if you're okay with 
completely getting rid of your pot in the long run and not being able to reuse it for a different plant later, then go with this option. And the reason this happens is just because the roots of your anthurium will stick to the sides and the bottom of your terracotta pot and you won't be able to just pull it out. So another kind of closed pot is just regular plastic pots. So the reason these aren't great is just because air circulation isn't the greatest and the roots at the bottom can eventually die. So it's not exactly pleasant. <laughs> So while yes, anthuriums will grow in these conditions, it is not ideal for them. So what is ideal for them is open containers. So open containers actually promotes growing good roots. And this actually results in rapid root growth for your anthuriums. And I've been so surprised since converting my anthuriums over to this method. I absolutely love it. I'm gonna show you exactly what I'm talking about. What I actually use are just these black net pots. There's so much oxygen flow in here. They absolutely love it and they just go crazy with growing. It's actually wonderful. <laughs> so I'm actually gonna show you here. This anthurium did not have a crazy amount of roots when I got it. And I already feel like I'm gonna have to repot it soon because it's been growing like a weed. Like <laughs> it's actually pretty incredible. Like I'm so happy. Like you can tell by my new leaf in here that he is super thrilled with his new little setup. And I'm actually so excited about it. Like you can even see, I don't know if you can see the bottom, but it's like, uh, it's so amazing. So the reason I use black pots and not clear pots, which feel free to use clear pots, is that if you do have the clear pots exposed, they are prone to developing algae. And while some people are fine with algae, I'm fine with not having algae. So I use the black net pots and I love them. So when you're picking a pot for your anthurium, make sure that they have some room to grow. A little too big is better than a little too small. And if you have a good potting mix, then a bigger pot is not gonna be an issue. So with repotting, you should be doing this probably about every one to two years. I think every year is probably the best policy or when it is root bound. So you'll know your anthurium is root bound when it has grown all along the sides of your pot and the bottom of the pot. So definitely, repot it if it is root bound. So there are actually a few different options for soil that you could actually use. So the first thing that a lot of people tend to like to use is just straight sphagnum moss. So as long as you apply, you know, properly nutrients when you water them, then growing them in sphagnum is completely fine. There's also the option for just straight rocks, but that's really gonna require constant moisture. So it's not something that I would suggest. And then there's um, this random myth of water floating around. So I'm gonna tell you right now, you cannot grow your anthurium in water. So never attempt them to grow them in an aquarium or in a vase. It's a hack that people like to use for their plants, but it's something that is not applicable to your anthurium and it will kill them. <laughs> They are not meant to be in standing water. So when it comes to shelf potting mixes, I would not recommend these at all. They are way too heavy. Really for any aeroid, just don't use any kind of shelf potting mix unless you are mixing it with other things. So when you think about their force, it's really gonna be a composition of leaf litter, charcoal, decaying wood, and compost. So here I'm gonna have really two different kind of soil combinations that I use. So for the first one, it's not one that I use anymore, mostly because of the peat in it. And I say that not because peat moss is bad for them, they love peat moss, but because I did have a fungus gnat issue and fungus gnats really love their peat moss. <laughs> but I wanted to include this because it is a good mixture. It is based on what the Missouri Botanical Gardens and Steve Lucas of the Exotic Rainforest use. They use a very similar composition to this. So that composition is gonna be about 30% miracle Grow, the moisture control potting mix, 20% high quality peat moss, 40% of any kind of orchid mix. So this is gonna be your barks, your gravel, your charcoal, and about 10% perlite. So the secondary mixture, which I deem much easier anyway, is one that I use quite frequently. And really you can just eyeball these mixes. They don't have to be exact. I'm just giving you proportions just to kind of show you roughly what I use. I use um, kind of a cup scooper anyway. So I'll kind of just tell you by cups for this mix here. So I use about seven cups of orchid bark, one cup perlite, one cup charcoal, one cup tree fern. That moisture control miracle grow, I use two cups of. So I mix this all together really well. And when I go to pot my anthurium, I make sure to put a layer at the bottom of my pot, I make sure not to plant it too deeply in the pot. I leave a part of the stem actually sticking out and definitely the crown, if that's the only thing available to stick out. <laughs> and then I usually just kind of top it off with fertilizer and then put a little more potting mix on top of that 
because they suggest with the slow release, you do mix that in a little bit. So for this last part, I'm just gonna talk about a little bit of plant maintenance. So for the first part, it's gonna be pruning. When to prune your anthurium. <laughs> so some reasons to prune your anthurium is just gonna be, so you have pests, you really want to get those off, you got your disease or infection, or you have just like excess of leaves, or they're at terrible angles where they're stretching your plant in a way that could break or deform them, or a possible saving of your plant, <laughs> or if there's just yellow or brown leaves. So if you are going to be doing it for aesthetic reasons, I do implore you to make sure you have at least four leaves left. While yes, a lot of our velvety anthuriums that we are purchasing have only about maybe one leaf in general, it can be very critical. Yes, it is something that could kill your anthurium if you cut off all of its leaves. Does not always happen, but be aware if you do cut off all of its leaves, that is a possibility that could happen to your anthurium. So here's just a quick sample of an anthurium that I have that it did have to cut off all of its leaves and it is growing a new leaf. So how to prune. So my favorite method, the cleanest method, absolutely adore this way, is really to just kind of like push down on the petiole where it connects to the stem of your anthurium until it kind of just pops off. Sometimes if you're able to just pull it off, it can come off very easily. It's especially if it's a leaf that already wants to come off. Now, if you can't get your anthurium to come off this way, another way you can do this is using shears. So make sure you sterilize them with each use. I either sanitize them with rubbing alcohol or diluted Fison 20. And this is great because it's a algicide, fungicide, bactericide, and it's something that I also dilute and clean my roots with when I get my new anthurium, just in case there's kind of any things like moldy or pesty, just kind of already in the plant. So with the shears, you're gonna, gonna try to just cut near the stalk. And when you are removing leaves, just try to go for the leaves that are in fact older. Other maintenance issue that I wanted to talk about is pest control. <laughs> so I usually mix about two tablespoons of Dr. Bronner's Peppermint Castile Soap. So this is wonderful stuff, guys. And I like the peppermint one. I actually also have the regular Castile Soap. It's the one I started with. And usually I use some kind of essential oils with them, like mint and rosemary. Really, if you're using the peppermint one, you really don't have to apply any more essential oils, such as more mint to this, because it already has it. But you can also add rosemary if you want to. It's actually great for breaking down the bodies of insects. Rosemary is a great option to actually add to your pest control solution. So with the solution, I pour it into a spray bottle and I spray. So you're going to want to spray the front of the leaves, the back of the leaves, and the petioles. So remember to fully coat them all around because you never know where your pests might be lurking. And then after about 20 minutes, I rinse it off with water. And usually I do this kind of in bulk with my plants. So I just have them sitting in my shower and I just rinse them all off. Also remember to make sure your shower water is not boiling or extremely cold and just put it at a lukewarm setting. <laughs> and then if you want to do an added measure, you can spray some neem oil on the soil surface. So I'm sure a lot of you still have a lot of questions, but these are really what I thought were the basic kind of care tips for your anthurium. This is a video that I would have loved starting out because I had so many questions and I was it's actually pleading for someone to put out this video. So I thought I would do this and I really hope it's helpful to you. I know I'm very excited to get this out there just to help people who want anthuriums or already have them. And I hope you really did enjoy it. So the takeaway from this video is to have one, a well draining soil mix, frequently water, have good air circulation, a comfortable temperature, good humidity, adequate sun, <laughs> and essential nutrients. So if you do all these things, you should really have no problem keeping your anthurium happy. It sounds like a lot, but in all honesty, once you have your anthurium potted up and it's in its ideal location, then really the only thing you have to think about is the amount of water and humidity you give your anthurium. And if you struggle with your anthurium's humidity, just make sure it is proper properly watered. Ideally, a thin boundary layer is desired around your anthurium's leaves. And this is key in creating your anthurium's personal humidity microclimate. And that is dependent on having enough water. So thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to see more content, please subscribe. I do put out a video every Wednesday and make sure to hit the bell icon. And thank you so much for watching.